how do you count victims of war is the first question and I think you can count them narrowly or broadly and I always recommend that to appreciate the horrors of war we've got to go broad you know imagine that you are 28 and you come out of the experience of the destruction of Aleppo you know and you were there and you experienced the horror but you also were contaminated with all kinds of chemical crap from the rubble the bombings and you end up in East London and then when you're 38 you get cancer is that connected to the war is it not connected to the war feels like it is feels like it is you know what's going to happen to people who come out of Mariupol 10 years from now is that part of the war or is that no longer part of the war you know um, when that plane falls on Russian territory that Russian plane and people get killed uh, wasn't shot down by Ukrainians but is that part of the war it's part of the war obviously it's part of the war when Ukrainians are huddled and we were talking about long COVID yesterday together in um, bomb shelters is their long COVID rate going to be up yeah are a lot of people with long COVID going to be people who are so sick they uh, can't walk? Yeah, of course, of course. Is that to do with the war? Yeah, it's to do with the war. It's to do with the war. Um, so war is toxic like that in the way it releases into the future and sometimes even into future generations. Um, disease, suffering, and dis-ease. Um, and that's why I think you've got to think about war as broadly as possible. And the more broadly you think about it, the more pernicious and toxic and endless its deleterious consequences seem to be. And we're going to do a proper q and I, I hope, um, soon enough after the next video on the main channel. Um, has Russian society degenerated specifically since the beginning of the war? Well, we've talked about trauma, the ghastliness of the Soviet experiment and how Russians in particular have been really bad at coming out of it. We've talked about the toxic depoliticization of the Russian population, although I think we need a kind of a major statement on that, rather the kind of major statement we made on propaganda. And I do think that there is a qualitative difference since the war um, I mean you've got very brutally speaking mothers and grandmothers having toxic fights um, about how their son is courageous but their neighbor's son isn't because their neighbor's son has no fortitude and has run away from the mobilization. But their son you know, is gone not to Georgia or Kazakhstan, but is gone to the front and is a real man. And why is he a real man? He's a real man because... <laughs> The Ukraine, Americans, it's, a, it's roughly that level of articulacy, the, the, the analysis of why Ukraine is a danger to Russia and why Ukraine is the kind of center of a conflict. Yeah, my son, because the... the 
and your son about the is not doing any not doing anything about that um interestingly <laughs> if you google videos i didn't even know these sites were still running of um chat chat roulette or meagle russians and ukrainians especially elder generations meeting on there it de degenerates into that i saw one the other day it was a ukrainian man in odessa and he was saying why are you bombing us and the woman was saying well there are some things you don't know and you've got to know them and she was sort of contained for 30 seconds and then after that 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 thing kicked in yeah so yes the answer is it's uh is degenerated beyond imagination since the beginning of the war. Was Putin democratically elected when he first came to office? No. No. It wasn't as much of a fraud situation um, as later elections, but it wasn't, it wasn't quite a fair election. But more than that, running up to the election, um, the whole regime faced a choice. Do we go the route of constitutional emphasis? And do we say we're going to strengthen the constitution, create um, a constitutional consolidation and use that as the leverage to facilitate whatever happens after Yeltsin is off? Or are we just going to effectively hire a successor almost in the kind of way that one would hire a family member to replace one uh, but there's just there isn't a family member there isn't quite the capacity to get away with a family member taking over but we're going to put in something that's a kind of substitute and push that through these were the two choices you know and the wrong choice was made and that's again one of the mistakes for the consequences of which are utterly catastrophic for the world not just russia um you've said nobody except putin on his security council would have started a full-scale war against ukraine can you elaborate on what the others think therefore it's a bit of a provocative statement because it's either true or nearly true that nobody else would have started a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Plenty of them would have started something with Ukraine. But I think if you want a cartoonish way of dividing it, you would say that somebody like Patrushev, for example, who is obviously a very hawkish member of the uh, Security Council, um, hawkish even by the standards of others on there, um, would have been fairly ideologically convinced of the project but less practically convinced so that's my guess you know so that neighbor next door we gotta take care of the neighbor for sure but i i think that if we do it mm, could cost us more than we gain from it maybe <laughs> so i think that there would have basically been a lack of practical confidence, but broad ideological sympathy for the project of not just saying Ukraine doesn't exist, but actually trying to act on that. Why is the regime demonizing gay people again? Doesn't it have bigger things to focus on? Um... So I predict that this stuff about um, gay folks um, and LGBTQ plus folks will get worse because there is a perception that that's a story that generates consensus among all of the elites and among a kind of sort of nuclear core of Putin's electorate. 
So it's something you can, it's got nothing to do. The, the, the degree to which this regime is genuinely constituted by homophobic people is way less than the, the rhetoric and the, 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 the politics, the actual politics, the laws suggest. It's political technology, so th there's not really much um, visceral homophobia among elites, and when it's there, you can always pick the individuals who manifest it. Um, so it's not it's not that kind of situation, but it's a bit of political technology because you can wheel that out and suddenly you get a univocal response or the perception of a univocal response and that's soothing especially when everybody seems to be in conflict about the war even the people who are rabidly in favor of the war are in conflict about how to prosecute it and why it's going so badly so unfortunately it makes sense for me to say that tool will just be used more um, does Putin heed the firm warning that he's received about using nuclear weapons from the USA? Mm. I think firmness and clarity on this behind the scenes is important. And I do think that there is room for a political analysis of this here that goes beyond the realm of what nuclear experts might come up with nuclear weapons you know experts might come up with because um, some of them have tended to say that you shouldn't even talk about the use of nuclear weapons you shouldn't even actualize these scenarios because you 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 um, basically participate in the weakening of a, of a taboo when you say, if you use nuclear weapons, this is what we would do. And the correct response, um, and I think this is what somebody like, like um, Podvig would argue, for example, um, the correct response is to say, how dare you talk about nuclear weapons? How dare you make escalatory threats? Um, as a major power, this is deeply unacceptable to us. I am probably persuaded, this is not my expertise, but it isn't entirely not my expertise because it's about how Putin reacts to this. Um, but I would say that I'm more persuaded by the idea of Putin having a, a clear sense of the bracket of practical response um, to him if this happens. And there needs to be dialogue with India and with China about what to do if that happens. Um, so... I'm persuaded of that, and to that extent I might say, yes, Putin is getting the point. But if you tell me the, the, the story I've heard from a lot of Western journalists and commentators in, in a crude way, so, yeah, we finally told Putin what's going to happen to him, so now he knows, so it's all sorted out. No, I think Putin is still entirely convinced that it's an option to use tactical nuclear weapons and he will or won't depending on what he judges, judges to be effective um, so the idea that he's received some kind of western warning that's intimidated him from being entirely convinced that that's an option i think that's just self-congratulatory rhetoric that's not has no bearing in reality um, you keep saying that there aren't oligarchs in Russia. Can you elaborate on this? Yes, you're an oligarch if you have power and money. Um, in Russia, there aren't people who have money. Like, there aren't people who really, really, really have money. Um, if you're in Russia and you have a lot of money, you're sort of renting it on a conditional basis. And the conditions are that you comply with whatever hoops the regime puts into place. Um, and that's extraordinary. I mean, you feel that straight away just when I've said this, how toxic that is. How toxic that is, you know, um, to sit on a couple of billion, but actually, no, they aren't really yours. They're only yours so long as you um, walk down a particular trajectory. So... Um, the idea of an oligarch 
implies a kind of independence that you know isn't applicable to any individual with significant financial resources in Russia. Talk very soon.